Hello, this is Brother Denny. Welcome to Charity Ministries. Our desire is that your life would be blessed and changed by this message. This message is not copyrighted and is not to be bought or sold. You are welcome to make copies for your friends and neighbors. If you would like additional messages, please go to our website for a complete listing at www.charityministries.org. If you would like a catalog of other sermons, please call 1-800-227-7902 or write to Charity Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, Ephra, PA, 17522. These messages are offered to all without charge by the free will offerings of God's people. A special thank you to all who support this ministry. Well, greetings this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for that singing. We'll see how the time goes. I'm supposed to have from 9 till 10.20. So, um... But I agree with Brother Ken, if you ever get an opportunity to lead the singing, you take it. It's a blessing. But if you ever get to preach, you better take that too. Because it's even more of a blessing. (laughs) All right. Let's stand before the Lord. Should we do that? Father, my Father, hallowed be thy name, O Lord, hallowed be thy name, God. Have mercy on us this morning. We trust you, Lord, for the grace, God, that we all need to give and to hear these words this morning. And we trust you, dear Father, for the outworking of all of it. Oh, may it extend the glory of your Son wherever we go. Have mercy on us, Father. We all pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, this morning, we want to speak on this subject. Endowment of power, how it is obtained. Endowment of power, how it is obtained. So, you know, get out your notepads. It's ten steps to power this morning, right? Wrong. No, God will not allow Himself to be put into any box like that. He will not allow it. As soon as you think you have it all figured out and you put him into a box and put it into ten steps, he'll turn right around and do it different for somebody else. He moves in mysterious ways and varied ways. And I think we all need to acknowledge that as we enter into this subject. Yet, we do need to cover this subject. The 120 in the upper room, I think of them this morning, there was some preparation before the day of Pentecost was fully come. 
some of it was just the natural outflow of the circumstances that God had set them in. I mean, you think about it. There they are. They're in the upper room. The last time they saw the Lord Jesus, He spoke a few words to them, lifted up His hands and disappeared into heaven. And so they are there. They're there with many unanswered questions about the kingdom and what all this means and where He went and what are we going to do next. They were there in the upper room with an insurmountable task He gave a few words to them before He left and told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. See you later. An insurmountable task. They were in that upper room. There were many fearful obstacles that they had to deal with. I mean, it's not that long ago they watched their Lord crucified on a cross. And they may be next. And they haven't any clue whether they will be or not. And there they are in the upper room. I would say it's a good preparation. What do you think? A good preparation for the, for receiving the holy, awesome, purifying, empowering presence of the living God. There in the upper room, they had a foundation of failure underneath them. That's all the reference they had. Me first, no me first, no me first. Speaking out of hand, saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. And to top it all off, they all forsook the Lord and fled. And Peter, he denied him three times. And they have all that underneath them too. That's a good preparation, isn't it? There they were in the upper room. They had the surety of a promise that Jesus gave to them. Ye shall. Ye shall, He said. That was the surety of a promise. And He gave them no set time or moment. He just said, Not many days hence. And there they are. No steps given, but God did prepare the circumstances for them and just told them to wait. Earnestly, expectantly wait for the promise of the Father. So, we can see from that that there was some preparation in all of this. It just wasn't some happenstance event that took place in their lives. And with all of that in their background, for ten days they dwelt in that posture, off and on in the upper room in one accord, seeking God and waiting. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly... Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. The sound filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, one hundred and twenty of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And we can see by this account that there was some preparation involved. For these 120, they spent ten days in that upper room. I don't know if you ever spent ten days in an upper room anywhere, but... uh, It wouldn't hurt you to do that every now and then. But I'm not here this morning to tell you if you spend ten days in an upper room, God will change your whole life and fill you with the power of the Holy Ghost. 
Because right after that, the 3,000 people who believed the words of the Apostle Peter received the same thing. And they didn't spend ten days waiting on it. Now, I, I admittedly, there was some qualifications there also. I mean, you considered where they were at that day when they cried out to Peter and said to Peter and to the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of the one you crucified 45, 50 days ago. Oh, well, well, I'm not sure if I'm ready to do that. Yeah, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, come, repent and be baptized. Lose your name. Lose your identity. Be forsaken. Be written off the rolls. Be counted as no longer living. Lose all your inheritance. Yeah, just come, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, there was some qualification there. Those 3,000 fearless souls that stepped forward that day, they, it wasn't just happenstance for them either. Oh, okay, sure, I'll do that. There was a cost involved. No doubt about it. They knew they would lose everything that day. And as I understand it, and as I evaluate it, I believe they got what the others got that day. And if you read on in chapter 2, from verse 42 to 47, it sure does seem that way. It's beautiful, sweet fellowship and, and uh, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking bread, prayers, fear came upon every soul, wonders and signs done by the apostles, they, and, they, they, and all that believed were together and had all things common. They sold their possessions and gave to every man who had need. And they were all with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added unto the church, such as should be saved. It seems to me that they received the Holy Ghost that day. The account of Paul the Apostle at Ephesus is a very different account there again. He shows up at Ephesus, finds twelve disciples there, begins sharing with them, asks them the question that we've discussed already this week, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Well, we knew not that there was a Holy Ghost. Well, what baptism are you baptized with? Well, the baptism of John under repentance. Oh, well, let me tell you about what has happened. Jesus... The Messiah he has come. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He, he, he poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost upon us. Oh, well, then let's get baptized. And they were baptized in the name of the Lord. And Paul laid his hands on them and prayed for them. And the Holy Ghost fell on them. And they began to speak with tongues and prophesy. Now, I'm giving these different examples because I want you to know that you can't put God in a box in some of these things. You can't say, okay, this is the way it's going to be. I've got it all figured out. I'll study it for a while when I feel comfortable with all the things that may do or may not do or may happen or may not happen, then I will step into the water. Don't, just don't even waste your time. God is just not like that. My personal belief is that you should and can receive an endowment of power when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're dealt with properly, you can. Seems to me in my study of the early Anabaptists, not Anabaptism, but the early Anabaptists, it seemed to me that they were endued with power when they believed. But again, let's look at the context there, brethren. Those men, when they went into the waters of baptism, it was a baptism of fire. They didn't know if they would live ten more days after their baptism. They didn't know if they had one more day after their baptism. And all the preparation of heart that was there in them made all the difference in the world. 
So I do believe that you can be endued with power from on high when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins and yielding your heart and life to Him. But, many don't. And that's why you're all here. Because many of you did not. And there are many reasons for that, and we're not here to debate that today. But, if you find yourself anemic, lacking in power, the power to walk, the power to have, live in victory over sin in your life, the power of the divine nature, the power of God for service in the building of God's kingdom. You can and must seek God for the blessing of Pentecost. You must have it. It's not an option. It's not something that, oh, oh just a few can have. But in fact, it is the New Testament reality. I talked to uh, dear old George Brunk, the evangelist, this morning. I wanted to give his testimony, but I wanted to get a clearing from him before I did. He's a very old man now, and I'm not sure, maybe he's near 90. But I told him what my subject was today, and I asked him if it was all right if I just give a little bit of his testimony and... He was very glad to give me that liberty. He was a Mennonite preacher. Going to church Sunday by Sunday. Same old dry sermons. Same old dry services. Same old dry singing. Same old dry everything. But something was stirring in that young minister. Many, many years ago, maybe back in 1950, I'm not exactly sure when it was, but something was stirring inside of that young minister. And I believe it was the Spirit of God saying inside of his heart, there's more than this, George, there's more than this. And he was probably another one of those foolish fellows that started reading books. And he, and he found out, yeah, there, there is more than this. Finally, one Sunday morning, he, he, he closed the door of the church house, finished off one more dry sermon, one more dry service, one more dry singing songs, and, and walked out the door of the church house and went to his house and told his wife, I'm going into my closet and I'm not coming out of there until God changes me. And if God doesn't change me, I'm not getting in the pulpit ever again. And he went into that closet. And I don't know how long he stayed in there, but he stayed in there a while. And I don't know what all the preparations were that took place inside of his heart, but the words that he gave to me this morning was that he fell on his face in utter desperation and said, God, I can't leave here until you do something and change me into a different man. And when that dear man came out of his closet, he began to prophesy in the power of the Holy Ghost. And the George Brunk revivals began. And they got a tent and they went all over. And many of you know the stories. That tent was set up in places all over the United States. And it was filled. It, it held five, six thousand people. And it was filled night after night after night for six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks. Pick up the tent, take it to the next place, put it down, open up the flaps that filled up again night after night, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks, all kinds of conversions, people's lives were being changed. Why? One dry, powerless preacher, just one, got desperate and said, this is enough. This is I'm not going to get in that pulpit again. If God doesn't do something in my life. I read the testimony of Duncan Campbell a few days ago. Duncan Campbell was the man that God used in the revival in the Hebrides in 1951. He was filled with the Holy Ghost 17 years before what I'm going to share with you. 17 years before. 
He was a young man. He was seeking God. He was desiring that God would use him. And he found himself in the war. I don't know if it was World War I. I can't remember. But he was in the cavalry and he was on a horse. And he was in the midst of a charge. And a shell went off near him and he was wounded, thrown from his horse and laying out there on the battlefield. And laying out there on the battlefield, he cried out to God. God had been dealing with his heart for weeks. He was in the war. All the filth, all the garbage, all the junk that goes along with war. And he was in there. And all this stuff was beating him from every direction. And he was crying to God to deliver him in here. And he was blown off of his horse and he lay there out in the middle of the battlefield. And another fellow went by in a horse and and the horse just stepped right on his spine, crunched right on his spine and kept on going. And he groaned out loud and the man that was riding the horse noticed there's a man laying there that's alive. And he came back and picked Duncan Campbell up and threw him over the horse and took him to the place where they fix you when you're all broken. And while he lay over the horse, bumping along out there on the battlefield, laying over that horse, he cried out to God and said, God, God, do it, Lord. Change me now, Lord, now. And while he hung over that horse, God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And they dropped him off at the ward where all the other fellows were that were shot and blown to pieces. And he was prophesying in Gaelic. And they all knew English. But he couldn't... Have, he was Gaelic. He's from Wales. He was prophesying in Gaelic, but nobody knew Gaelic. But he couldn't help himself. By the time he left that place, I think he won ten souls to the Lord. Well, 17 years went by. Busy preacher. Famous man. Lots of places to go. Lots of things to do. Your heart started getting cold. And he lost the power. One day his young daughter, 16-year-old daughter, sat in there. And said, Daddy, you don't have the power that you used to have in your life. It's not there, Daddy. I don't know why it's not there, but it's not there and you know it. Please, Daddy, get what you had 17 years ago. Whatever you have to do. And that went like a knife to that man's heart. Because he knew it was right. Busy man. Busy man. Go, 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 go. Yeah. And the anointing just dwindled away from him. He fell on his face in his study and said, I'm not coming out of here until God gives me the anointing that I had back there. And at two o'clock in the morning, God came through. And there were things that God dealt with him about. And there were disobediences which God laid upon his heart. But when God came through, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. He was overwhelmed with the presence of the living God. At two o'clock in the morning, and his daughter heard what was going on in there. And she came in there and lay next to her papa. And she thought, he's going to go crazy. He was so overjoyed with the unction of the Holy Ghost. She thought, my dad's going to go nuts. She laid her hand on him and said, Oh God, please don't let my dad go crazy. And he, was, and he said later, she didn't realize I had the most sound mind I ever had in all my life. I wasn't going to go crazy. I was full of the living God. And it was a couple of years after that that he received the assignment from the Holy Ghost to go to the Hebrides where the revival was. How is it today? 
with you. Have you been endued with power since ye believe? Maybe you're not even born again. That's possible. The group like this, you're trying to figure this whole thing out and all, the, all that's going on around here and you feel like you're standing on the outside looking in at all this, these nuts around here and all their enthusiasm and excitement and all of that. Maybe you're not born again. But I want to encourage you, if you're not born again, get born again the right way. And get the whole thing while you're at it. Don't play around. Or, are you one of those who you look back and you remember? You remember. Oh, restless soul, you will never be at rest with that memory in your heart. Because you know, you know what God did and what God can do. Don't stop until you are back there where you were in the past. I'd like to look at five points that relate to the obtaining of the Holy Spirit's power in our lives. Five points. First of all, we must have an awareness of a great need in our life. We must have an awareness of a great need in our life. I see my need. The 120 there in the upper room, they saw their need. They had an awareness of a great need in their life. Your heart must be that way. Your heart must be bearing witness. I lack. I am powerless. I am weary of my powerless life. And I sense my need. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That verse applies right here. Blessed are they that mourn. That verse applies right here. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. That verse applies right here. There must be a sense of need in your heart. Now you can have this recognition of need and be clear and up to date with God. But it may be you have a sense of need because there's sin in your life. I cannot stand up here and tell you, oh, you can get the Holy Ghost with all that sin in your life. I cannot tell you that. You must be willing to deal with sin in your life if it is there. The heart must be clear. Is your heart clear? You need to get thoroughly right with God. That's one thing I would recommend to you. You need to get thoroughly right with God. To where your heart is at peace before the Lord. And there is no thing that is popping up before you where God is saying, deal with this. Deal with this. You say, well, Brother Denny, I don't sense my need. There may be some in this room that you don't. Ask God. To open your eyes. You, you do have a need. You just don't see it. Ask God to open your eyes. You have a need. Read the Word with a heart of examination. And see how you measure up. Read a biography. Read a story about what God did in somebody else's life. And when you get finished, shut the book and bow your head and say, God, what about me? And let that sink down inside of your heart. There must be a sense of need. A sense of your moral and 
spiritual impotency that must be there. Number two, an abandoned desire for God. And the one rises out of the other. An abandoned desire for God. I sense my need. And I long for God to meet that need. An abandoned desire for God. Lord, anything. Lord, anywhere. Lord, any cost. I don't care. That's the way it was with those two men that I shared with you. That's their, that was both of their testimony. Anything, anywhere, any cost, Lord, any cost. An abandoned desire for God. I must have the overwhelming presence of God in my life. I must. I cannot go on. If any man thirsts, the Scripture says, If any man thirsts, there must be an abandoned desire. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground, Isaiah 44, 3 says. I will pour water, the water of my Spirit, upon him who is thirsty. There must be an abandoned desire. Like Moses, you know, I will not go up if you don't go with me. Moses said to God, that's how George Bronk felt, wasn't it? And that's the way it was with Duncan Campbell when he went in that room. He said to God, I will not go up in that pulpit again unless you go up with me. An unreserved giving up. An unreserved giving up. Why? Because we're not looking for a power. We're not seeking a power. We are seeking a person. And that person is the living God. And when you get in the presence of the living God, unreserved abandonment is the only thing that is acceptable in the presence of the living God. Un Reserved abandonment. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. An unreserved, abandoned desire for God. Some of you men have been playing around for 20 years. It's a long time to play around. You know, you know it. You've been powerless for 20 years. Time's up. Time's up. It's time to get serious. You know, it was that way with those in the upper room, wasn't it? Those 120. There was an abandonment and an overwhelming desire for God. I don't believe that God is going to meet with somebody who showed up here this week to put his time in for the seminar and bless God, let's get the seminar over with and I've got business to take care of and I want to get home and it's business as usual when I get back home. If that's your heart attitude... God is not going to meet you. He will not meet you. This isn't a haphazard thing. We're not dealing with some, some power entity that you can carry around in your back pocket. We're dealing with the presence of the living God of the universe. 
And He requires, demands, an unreserved abandonment and desire for Him. Number three, seeking, an earnest seeking. If thou seekest Him with all thine heart, He, He will be found of thee. What are we seeking? An experience? A feeling? A power? No. God Himself. A.B. Simpson said it so beautifully in a little poem and a song that he wrote. Once it was the blessing that I was seeking. Now it is the Lord I'm seeking. Once it was the feeling I was seeking. Now it is His Word. Once His gift I wanted. Now the giver I own. Once I sought for healing. Now Himself alone. There must be an earnest seeking, an earnest seeking for the living God. There must be a heart that unites with so many of the words of the psalmist David. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? cries the psalmist David, an earnest, seeking heart after God. An amount of time is involved in that. This is not a flippant thing. And a length of time is involved. And your heart should say, I don't care how long. I don't care how long. Prayer is involved, fervent prayer. Openness to God's revealing. As we come before God and say, God, You know my need. I'm coming to You. I'm seeking Your face. You know my need. There must be an openness of heart that God can turn on His revealing searchlight. And I would encourage even some times of fasting which brings brokenness into your heart and your life. Number four, importunate prayer. <clears throat> prayer is the language of the poor. Fervent prayer, unceasing prayer, early morning prayer, corporate prayer, believing prayer, importunate prayer. And I'd like to say a little bit about motives here, because motives do come in. Although, my personal belief is, if you are, in fact, seeking God, most of the motives take care of themselves. If you're seeking the power hmm, for me, then motives come in here, don't they? I want to be somebody. I want to be important. I want to be able to stand up there someday. Or whatever it may be. I want to work a miracle so everyone will look at me. Ah, you ask and you ask and you ask, but you have not because you ask amiss. Motives are involved. And God, He's a beautiful revealer of motives and He'll show you. He will. But I just want to lay that there. That sometimes motives are involved that hinder the power of the Holy Ghost to rest upon a man because the motives are wrong. He's got some other motive in there. I'd like to be somebody. I want to be important. I want to be the preacher. I want everybody to look to me. You'll never get there. you never get there. Importunate prayer. Importunate prayer. Prayer that becomes a cry where there's an element of desperation. Like Acts chapter 4, remember? After they were threatened, 
Their prayers were a cry. They lifted up their voices in one accord and cried out to God, Oh Lord, behold now their threatenings. A desperation in their hearts. I'm not talking about your normal, quiet little prayers. and I don't have a problem with, you know, the prayers that you pray, but I'm not talking about those normal, quiet little prayers. I'm not talking about the prayer at mealtime at your house or the prayer that you pray with the family before you go to bed at night. I'm talking about the kind of prayer that you pray when your little child is sick and dying and you don't know what to do except to cast yourself upon God and plead for Him to do something about the situation. I'm talking about that kind of prayer. When your prayer becomes a cry that comes out of the depths of your soul, an importunate prayer and cry to God, I can't go on, Lord, I can't. So we're not talking about just working up our emotions. There may be emotions there. Father usually does get a bit emotional if his child is dying, doesn't he? But it's deeper than just emotion when his child is dying. It's coming from the depths of his soul. And that's what we're talking about. Number five. A waiting, believing expectancy. A waiting, believing expectancy. This is by faith, brethren. This is by faith. Just like in salvation, a desperate, repentant heart cries out to God to have mercy upon them by faith, and God beautifully saves them, so also, if you find yourself here today and you say, I am in need of the endowment of God's power upon my life, I want to tell you this morning, it is By grace, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. Can I take that verse and put it in here? Because seriously, we're really only talking about the reality of the salvation life, aren't we? And it is by grace, through faith, and it's not of yourself. It is the gift of God, just like Peter said, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. Lest any man should put himself a little program together and tell everybody, now you do this, 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 and this, and you'll get it. No. It is the gift of God. It is the promise of the Father. Many, many have burned themselves out with extreme fastings and other austerities out of a desire for God to work in their lives. They have burned themselves out with extreme fastings. They have put themselves through rigorous self-examinations to where they found themselves in a pit of despair and fallen into deep depressions and been deceived by false spirits through extreme Extreme actions. These things happen. But brethren, I'm here to tell you, it is by grace through faith. By faith. I see my need, but I believe that God has and will provide for my need. I have a desire but I believe that God will give me the desires of my heart. I am seeking God, but while I'm seeking God, I know that those who seek Him with all their heart will find Him. And there is that confidence that is undergirding all that I'm doing. That element of faith must be there. I am praying fervently, but I'm praying believing prayer. Let's turn to Luke chapter 11. We see all of these five elements in 
in the lessons that Jesus gave to His disciples on prayer. They're all here. You know, it came to pass as He was praying in a certain place, when He ceased, one of His disciples said unto Him, Lord, teach us to pray. Well, I believe these disciples, they watched Jesus pray, and they saw the results of His prayers, they saw the overwhelming presence of God upon his life when he finished praying. They saw the overwhelming character in his life as he prayed. They saw the overwhelming supernatural grace of God working through his life when he prayed. And they came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Wouldn't you ask him that question? So, I want to preface you know, what we're going to look at here with that. Lord, I see the grace, the power, the beauty, the majesty of the presence of your Father upon your life. Teach me how to pray. Well, he gives the, what they call the Lord's Prayer, first of all. And we're not going to look at that here. We're going to drop down to verse 5. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Let's just ponder that a moment. Lord, I need. Why? So I can give. Right? Lord, I need. I need. So I can give. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Importunity. And he knows he's going to get that bread. The faith is there. He's going to give me that bread. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep on asking Him. Hey, I've got to have something to feed my guests. Please get up. I'm not going to get up. I'm already in bed with my children. <laughs> I'm not going to take no for an answer. I have to give this person some bread. Please get out of bed and give it to me. I'm not going to get out of bed. I'm not going to take no for an answer. I know you're going to give me that bread. Please get out of bed and give me that bread so I can feed my friend. And finally, he will get out of bed and give him his bread, and he will feed his friend. That's what we're talking about. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, his shameless persistence, right? Come boldly before the throne of grace with shameless persistence, that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then he goes on in verse 9, and it, 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 just, it just flows right along. It's all the same lesson. I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. There's that believing prayer again. Ask, seek, knock. And if I may say, these words are present continuous words. Ask and keep on asking and keep on asking and ye shall receive. Seek and keep on seeking and keep on seeking and ye shall find. Knock and keep on knocking and keep on knocking and the door shall be opened unto you. That is the context of that verse. And that is the context of what we are speaking about here today as we come to grips with the fact that we are powerless, that God's grace is not working mightily in our lives, Ask and keep on asking and keep on asking and you shall receive. Jesus says, For every one that asketh and asketh and asketh 
receiveth, and he that seeketh, and seeketh, and seeketh, findeth. And him that knocketh, it shall be opened. That's a promise, brethren. That's a promise. And I want to apply it to the subject at hand here today. I believe it applies in many, many, many different ways. But I want to apply it today. And we will see as we go a little bit further down that the Lord Jesus also did. Teach us how to pray, Lord. Now, He reasons with them. If a son asks bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? And of course, each one of those, they're an absurd statement. And it's given that way to help you to realize. Of course not. And may I say today, God's not going to give you a devil. He's not going to give you a devil. Father won't give you a devil. If you ask him for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. You need to believe that. Verse 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more? Do you know what much more means? Much more means this. If ye, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask? That's what that word much more means. So surely if you know how to give bread to your boy when he's hungry, don't you think your Heavenly Father knows how to give bread to you? And the whole idea in that verse is a confidence that a a faith rises up inside of the heart. a, A confident, believing faith that God will in fact give me that which He promised me He will give me. And remember, Jesus is teaching His disciples how to pray. And there are many things to pray for, but please put this one at the top of your list. Because, as I've said already, this is not a one-time thing. We're talking about New Testament Christianity here this morning. So we need to figure out how to do this thing and keep it going. Amen? Brethren, the promise is unto you and unto your children and to them that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Are you the called this morning? The promise is unto you. We need to believe it. Yes, we need to have a longing desire. Yes, we need to recognize our need without it. But in all of those things that we need to recognize and all that other things that God may work in our own hearts in preparation. And He has the freedom to do all kinds of different things in each one of our hearts. In all of those things, there should be that believing expectancy. Say, well, Brother Denny, You mean I can get the Holy Ghost today? Well, God may. God may empower your life before this day is out. But God may not empower your life for the next 30 days. But the question that I leave with you is, what are you going to do for the next 30 days if you leave these meetings and you know I have no power in my life? Are you just going to go back home to the same old status quo? Well, well, it was nice meetings and boy, there's some good hot sermons around there, but okay, 
business as usual, right back to the same old anemic Christianity that I've been living in for the last ten years. I hope you don't go home and do that. If God doesn't meet your need this week, there should be an earnest, faith-filled heart of expectancy that says, this is what God wills for my life and I'm not going to stop seeking and believing God until I have the power of the living Christ upon my life. Now, I thought about it earlier this morning. You know, I... I could give an invitation right now and fill this altar from one end to the other. But you know, I'm not into that. You just heard a stirring message and your hearts are just stirred by what you've heard. And I mean, you know, some of you are probably saying, Brother, give us an invitation. Give us an opportunity. I want to fall on my face now. Hey, uh, sorry, but I'd like to go a little deeper than that. Seriously. I'd like you to go a bit deeper than that. If in fact, God is stirring your heart. That truly heavenly desire, it will not leave you if I, if you don't get an invitation right now. You're not gonna miss the thing if I don't give you an invitation right now so you can, with all the earnestness that's in your heart because you just heard the sermon, you're gonna get up here and get it. You know what you'll get? You'll just get an emotional experience. I don't want you to get an emotional experience. I want you to get The living God settling down upon your heart in your life and then His abiding presence in your life so that six months from now and two years from now, you and everybody around you knows that you are a totally changed person and they'll know without a doubt it isn't anything you did, it isn't any steps you went through, it is the presence of the living God upon your heart in your life. That's what I want for you. I want to say something about pride here. You know, maybe God touches you. Maybe you get through to God this week. And your heart's overflowing with grace, power, and joy. And everything's different and you know it. Don't get proud. Please, you don't have anything special. That's the normal, my friend. Welcome home. What took you so long? You know, I mean, you get these ideas in their head. Oh, we've got it, boy, we've got it. I've got something, nobody... No, you just have what everybody's supposed to have. Don't let pride come into your heart. You have these big ideas about this supernatural, this or that that is upon you. Now you're just a normal Christian. So walk humbly before your God and that grace will stay upon your life. There are many ways and many situations. God works in all kinds of ways. There are times when, in my own experience, when I know I have a message like this to give, when I can seek the face of God and break my heart before God and get up in the pulpit and know that the presence of the living God is upon me. But there are other times when God totally shocks me and I didn't do anything and I didn't pray anything and I didn't fast and I and nothing. It just boom like that. I'm in the middle of the presence of the living God in a certain situation. You can't put God in a box. You just can't. So, I want to re-emphasize that. I'm not giving you some formula. But at the same time, in many situations, there are things we can do. You know, if our heart is cold, there are times when my heart gets cold. Busy, busy, business, go, go, this, that. Busy, 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 God's business. Go, go, this, that. And I begin to sense a coldness settling in in my heart. Well, my conscience won't let me stay there. And I begin to say in my heart, this is not good. I don't want to get up in that pulpit. 
and just say a bunch of words. So I'm going to go crawl in a hole for about three days with my Bible and seek the face of God and break my heart and come to God in believing prayer, knowing and believing and trusting that surely if I, being an evil father, make sure that my boys get what they need, surely my heavenly Father will meet my need in that hole where I've crawled. And God does. And I'm getting ahead of the week here into the subject of maintaining the anointing upon our lives. Because you see, we're only just talking about getting to first base. Amen? Um, We're just dealing with first base today. Just first base. I want to say something about speaking in tongues. You seek God. You break your heart before God. God pours out His Spirit upon you. You might speak in tongues. Sometimes that happens. Many times it doesn't happen. But sometimes it happens. And if we're going to be honest with this Bible, at least for me, I can't stand up here and wiggle my way through all those verses in the Bible and and give you a nice theological reason why all of those things have passed away. I can't do that. I don't speak in tongues. I've never spoken in tongues. That's not the longing of my heart. I'll tell you what I pray. Continually I pray. I plead and beg God that I might prophesy. God, to the edifying of the church, I want to prophesy. So I've been hooked on that gift for a long time. so, so, So I'm just saying that because, hey, that may happen. But I know there's a lot of confusion about all that in this America where we live and there's a lot of emotional confusion on it and there's a lot of static, emotional uh, working up of things and and it's not at all what I'm talking about. Not at all. Most of it is spurious. You know, as for me, I'll take Moody or Finney's anointing any day over this stuff that they seem to be having in, in this America. I'll take Moody's anointing and never have to speak in another tongue. I'll take Finney's anointing any day over that. The point I'm making is, again, we're not looking for an experience. We are looking for the divine nature of God descending upon a man's life, overwhelming him with His presence and putting the character of the living God in his heart and the anointing upon His words. This I want. This I want. And you should also want and seek with all your heart, believing, believing, much more shall the Heavenly Father give to them that ask. Much, much more. All right. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, we love You, Lord. We thank You. Thank You for saving us, Lord. Oh, we rejoice. Our names are written in heaven today. Our names are written in heaven. And we thank You, Father. I just commit these words into the hearts of these men. Oh, Father, let it bear fruit. Father, God, as I thought about it and prayed this morning, you know my prayer, Father. Even if ten men in this room will get a hold of this, we will all know it. But, oh God, the potential is so far reaching, God. We are trusting you, Lord, that you will take your word by your Spirit. And lead us on, O King Eternal.